good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen wherever you are so an inaugural lecture is a very old academic tradition in 1669 professor isaac newton was appointed to the lucasian professor of mathematics at trinity college in cambridge and he spoke on the topic of colors now newton of course is known very well for his theories of mechanics and gravitation but we also know from the time we spent in school that he also did work on optics and uh, and colors over 300 years later professor steven hawking was appointed to the same lucasian chair of mathematics at trinity college and he spoke in his inaugural lecture on the topic is the end in sight for theoretical physics so uh, to have an inaugural lecture when the university promotes an inaugural lecture it is standing in the line of a long tradition the second thing that i want to say is that you know in the early days the word professor was used uh, rather indiscriminately in the in the very early days anyone who taught was also called a professor and i think uh, in italy we get this same idea because any teacher is called professori but in the english speaking world now there is a very clear distinction between people who are professors and people who are just normal lecturers so i think there are a few differences between lecturers and professors the general audience for a lecturer is a group of students whereas where a professor is concerned when the university bestows the title of professor on one of its teachers it means that that person is ready to face the world and his audience is the is the public is the world lecturers when they teach students they generally tell students about established knowledge it is a dissemination or transmission of established knowledge but professors are expected to discover new knowledge and be at that cutting edge of knowledge in lectures generally what is covered is in the area of facts it is facts that are transmitted to students but professors are expected to develop theories and a theory is something like a belief because the word profess is often used in the context of a belief what i profess what i believe the theories i hold and we expect of professors that they will hold theories because a theory is something that is held in without regard without undue regard to everyday experience right so for example uh, nicolaus copernicus you know although every morning like the rest of the people during his time he saw the sun rising in the east and setting in the west he was bold enough to say that although this is what things appear to be actually it is the earth that is going turning around its axis and the 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 the, the earth is going around the sun and more recently sir john baker who was professor of mechanical sciences at cambridge university was bold enough to say that when we design structures we should not look at the way that they normally behave but think about the point of failure and so gave rise to a whole new theory of uh, of plastic design so professors are expected to hold beliefs to profess those beliefs and to be able to defend those beliefs in front of the public thank you hi bohan and good day all who are joining from uh, many parts we especially welcome all the audience and uh, especially the vice chancellor and uh, deputy vice chancellor who are with us today and of course uh, a warm welcome to our second speaker the inaugural uh, lecture series professor jagat munasinghe and uh, it's my pleasure now to invite uh, deputy vice chancellor professor mahanam to introduce today's speaker good evening all of you vice chancellor professor niranya gunawardena dean faculty of graduate studies professor ajit dalwis and professor jagat munasinghe and uh, other staff members and dear participants it is uh, i am pleased to introduce professor jagat munasinghe on the occasion of second inaugural lecture of the university of moratua organized as part of the inaugural lecture series by the faculty of graduate studies of the university of moratua 
Dr. Jagat Munasinghe had been a senior lecturer at the Department of Town and Country Planning of the University of Morotua since 1999 until being promoted to the professorship. He was a graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Built Environment degree in 1999 and Master of Science in Architecture <coughs> from the University of Morotua in 1993. He has also completed a Master of Science in Town and Country Planning degree from the University of Morotua in 1999. So Jagat Buru Singh had obtained his PhD in Planning and Urban Design from National University of Singapore in 2004. He is a Chartered Town plan Architect and a Chartered Town Planner. Being a fellow member of the Sri Lankan Architects, he has served in various committees of SLIA and he is also a fellow member of Institute of Town Planners Sri Lanka where he served as the President of the Institute during 2019-20 period. Previously, he has been an Honorary Secretary of the Institute Town Planner Sri Lanka 2013 and 2015 period. He has been a leading consultant's team in many development projects that are nationally significant. Professor Munasinghe has held nationally prestigious position of Director General of the National Physical Planning Department of Sri Lanka during 2016 and 2019 period, and also the Chairman of the Urban Development Authority of Sri Lanka during the same period. Being an academic, Professor Munasinghe held the position of Head of Department of the Town and Country Planning during the period of 2018, 2008, and 2014 period. He was also the Director of Postgraduate Studies at the Department of Town and Planning and the Director of the Faculty of Architecture Research Unit at the University of Morotua. Professor Munasinghe pioneered the Planning Research Journal of the University of Morotua, namely BUMI, and held the position of Editor-in-Chief of the journal since January 2008 to date. He also pioneered the Master of Spatial Planning, Management and Design program in collaboration with the Lathrop University as a joint degree in Australia in 2012. Professor Bonusing has rendered his academic services as a visiting lecturer at various national and international institutions, including the Institute of Surveyors Sri Lanka, the Department of Survey Science, Sabargon University, the Department of State Manual Evaluation, University of Javadunapura, the Department of Spatial Sciences in Kotalawala Defense Academy and in the Faculty of Architecture and Design in Nirma University, Ahmedabad, India. Among many the national significant tasks, he has been entrusted with most prominent other being a member of President Experts Committee for Sustainable Sri Lanka, Vision 2030, strategic path established by the government of Sri Lanka in 2017-18 period and being the leader of the team, National Physical Planning Policy and the Plan 2050 for Sri Lanka, prepared by National Physical Department in 2016 and 18. Professor Munasinghe has been awarded with many nationally and internationally prestigious awards, and he was awarded the Property Personal of the Year Award in 2018 by the Asian Property Guru Service Services. In 2006, he was awarded South Asian Research Fellowship by the Social Scientist Research Council in New York. He was also awarded for, for National Housing Research Travel Award by Cambridge University, UK in 2004, and the John Lysart Fellowship to fellow, uh, follow MSc in architecture in 1992. Further, during his studies, he was awarded the CIC Charitable Trust Fund Award for highest aggregate in second year of the course of BSc Built Environment University of Morotua in 1990, and awarded the University of Morotua Award for highest aggregate in first year of this course BSc Built Environment University of Morotua in 1987. The list of Professor Jagat Munasinghe's achievement and contribution at national and international level, both in academia and practice, can go off on if I continue. Nevertheless. Because the time, uh, let me finish this shortening this citation, and it is my pleasure now invite Professor Jagat Munasinghe to address the forum, the topic of making and non-making national future plan 2050. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, the professors, 
and those who join with us today, both on invitation and uninvited, and both physically and on virtual mode. And I'm thankful to the Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies for giving me this opportunity, even though I'm playing the role of the savior or a night watchman in the absence of the person, those who are supposed to make this presentation today in the second in line. But anyway, uh, I always think that the earlier the better. Uh, therefore, here I am, because I got this opportunity now. Oh, thank you very much, uh, the Dean Gradu Faculty of Graduate Studies. Now, I would uh, make this presentation, uh, the focus presentation with a small, I would say, Sorry, I will. I, I would make a some some product to my right. Okay, so you may call it an anecdote as well. Um, so let me let me uh, tell a little bit about my journey towards this professorship uh, before I go into the focus matter. So I would dedicate this lecture to all those who had the dream to make me a professor, except for myself. Right, the K. D. Fernando sir. Mr. Gary Fernando, who is the retired uh, lecturer, senior lecturer in my department, and uh, Ms. Madam Susanta Amaravikrama, the current head of the department of this, uh, head of the department of the department on country planning, and my own junior colleagues in the department, and the non-academic staff, so loving and so kind, and uh, my friends in the university and outside, because it is their wish that has been granted today, and uh, that made me a professor today. To tell you very frankly, I had no such dream of becoming a professor. I had no intention to become an academic even. Rather, I had the dream to become a good architect, a good designer, enjoying the nuances of nature, exploring deep into culture and technology, and also of great work by these designers in the world, throughout the world. So I was trained to be an architect, and I was thinking like an architect. Having learned architecture, and practiced architecture for some time, I have learned, at least sensed, the depth of the world. It was rather by accident that I, happen, that I happened to join the Department of Town and Country Planning. Late Mr. Krishna Seram, who was my guru and who had been my mentor throughout, and a role model, an exemplary teacher in my academic life. It was him who encouraged me to join the academia. It was not only an opportunity that I got to explore subject planning in detail, but also to learn the culture of the academia. But after joining the field of town planning only, I realized the width and the breadth of the world and the vastness of the field of knowledge one can explore. So it was the department that gave me that opportunity. It was there I got the interest in higher studies. While going through the master's program, that was offered by the Department of Town and Country Planning at that time. I was looking for opportunities, and as a result, I got two offers to pursue a PhD, one from the National University of Singapore and the other one from the Queensland University. They both came at the same time, but at a critical moment, where the master's degree was halfway through, and my second son was just born. In order to make this difficult decision, whether to go or not to go, whether to take it or not to take, I had many consultations, different opinions, advices, suggestions, and so on. But at first, it was at this juncture. It was the retired professor, ALS Perra, who was the head of the department at that time, gave me a peculiar advice. What he said was, if, you intend, if your intention is to learn and come back and practice planning in Sri Lanka, your choice must be Singapore. And if you intend to migrate, of course, no problem, go ahead with Queensland. This was what he told me, right? And it was a kind of peculiar dis uh, advice, of course, because I don't think anyone would advise you to come back nowadays. Right? But anyway, he, he did it like that. So after many thoughts, I selected NUS because I had no intention of migrating. Even to date, I don't have that kind of an idea. It was another turning point in my life, however. When I, studying in, uh, when I was studying in NUS, National Institute of Singapore, I realized that there's another dimension to this knowledge, world of knowledge. Maybe we can call it time, because we are living in a fast-evolving world 
things are moving faster and it's taking us leave, uh, that taking the world faster leaving all of, all of us behind one of my professors in us told me this story that is that this this uh, that is you know this world is like a bicycle that we have to paddle throughout the moment that you stop paddling you'll it will collapse right so knowledge is something like that knowledge is not static and it evolves with time all what were taught to us as eternal truth and nothing but the truth are not just necessarily the truth rather knowledge is also a product it is produced and reproduced produced and marketed produced but wasted produced and expired and also produced yet banned and suppressed knowledge is an enterprise i believe this university morato also is thinking it line in that line had i not been going through my phd experience in the nus this wouldn't have been not known to me that's why i fully agree with professor malik kranasinghe who was a vice chancellor of this university at that time had been insisting our academics to pursue phd's in leading universities outside sri lanka phd is not just three letters of words and a voluminous research thesis rather it's a lifetime experience unforgettable association and a great exposure it is with much gratitude that i remember my phd supervisors professor simdooli professor malonli and professor jujiming and other academics my research colleagues in nus and my friends whom i have met there in singapore and those who are with us today many of them are with us in this university today it was a great time and remarkable learning experience after coming back with lot of dreams to do research to carry out lot of innovative work a lot of ideas but there were all sort of responsibilities felt on fell on my shoulder i happened to become the head of the department within a short period which i did not expect and the director of the faculty of architecture research unit and the director of the postgraduate studies in the department and there came this asian planning schools association associations conference which we could not do with the capacity that we had unless we do a lot of work my association with institute of town planners and institute of architects and there also there was work some of which were not necessarily imposed on me but initiated on my own ambition and my own interest but all at the same time kept me away from thinking of my own personal developments i would say i still had no reason to become a professor i can remember professor malik ran singh our vice chancellor at that time asked to apply for the professorship why don't you launch your application for the professorship and mr k d fernando my lecturer in the university along with the other colleagues in the department were chasing behind me to the extent that i happen i happen to say sometimes i was not chasing behind the professorship rather the professorship is chasing behind me that was the kind of understanding i had that was for two reasons one is this workload that i had because i had no time to kind of concentrate on this application and the second one is the image i had of the professors with all due respects to all the professors those who have to it here today i must say i had my own image of professors i have seen only a few professors in my life i had a few role models of professors right i have noticed a few qualities essential qualities in them that made them professors right? i can remember professor priyan dais he was talking about this professors and their knowledge and the contribution in the last times first inaugural lecture so i agree with him a lot and most of the things i think also is aligned with what he has told the first quality is the wide and depth in depth knowledge in the subjects that they profess and in addition to many other subjects in buddhist literature we call it bahusruta bhav right? and talk only sense and do not boast about their knowledge boast about their achievements right? one of the examples i can quote here is professor anandas godagad whom i have seen in my childhood when i was a school child children a school student at that time o level class right? he had this quality he was talking about art culture poetry and so many other things over and above and in addition to his excessive knowledge in forensic medicine that was a professorship i expected and also have an opinion second quality is this have an opinion and stand for that opinion we call it riju patipanna bhave right so he has this one and that does not bend for personal gains and own benefits which i would see again in professor 
Nanda Kusokuda Goda, I remember still. The, he was brave enough to lead the funeral procession of this medical student who was assassinated in a protest, even under the hostile political environment and that privilege that could have taken he, even his life. He was brave enough for that. That is the professorship that I, 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 I was thinking about. And also the humble and human empathetic behavior, which we can call mudita guna, right? mudita that is that you have this, uh, you, 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 you are happy with your achieve, achievement of your, of your followers and full of attention and care, human supportive advice. No favorisms, no humiliations, no personal grudge. That is the third quality that I expected in a professor. So those were the images in my own kind of uh, world of professors. So that was my image of a professor. And I was not sure whether I had these qualities in me yet. That's why I didn't want to become a professor. Because I didn't want to be called professor until such time I would have at least a fraction of them in me. Right? Because I know this professorship is not just a promotion, not just a privilege, and not only an honor. But it is, a, it is more importantly a great responsibility. So all of us know, even if I crack a joke, people will take it serious. Therefore, I will have to be very careful of all the statements, every word that I, that I utter. So it's going to be a serious world. So it's going to be a serious situation where I have to be, have, a, have a kind of difficult time in future. Right? So I will be able to, uh, I hope that I will be able to continue with this responsibility. Right. While things have been deferred in this manner, I was invited to, or rather forced, to be appointed to the position of the Director General of the National Physical Planning Department, which is known as NPPD. Later, the sudden vacation of the position of the chairman by the chairman of the UDA, Urban Development Authority, that also was forced onto me. I was so reluctant at the beginning, but the repeated requests coming from my friends and the colleagues and the political authority, I had no choice but to accept it. So I was compelled to take the appointment. This was another turning point in my life. I wanted to make it an opportunity to test and further develop academic knowledge that I was developing in this university of Morotu in the Department of Town and Country Plan. So that is the uh, place where I could develop some more and I could give knowledge, gain, my, gain more knowledge in the field. And also to contribute this knowledge that I have gained in the university for some fruitful purpose. My intention was to mend the prevalent gap between the academia and the planning field in many institutions like the Urban Development Authority, National Physical Planning Department, and so on, who are who involved actively in all in planning activities in Sri Lanka. <coughs> so. By introducing some of my work, my own work, and the other research work in the university, and also research done in outside our university, and also out, uh, in other parts of the world, into practice, I was so very fortunate, because I don't think that uh, the many get that opportunity. Especially, I must be thankful to the minister of minister in charge of the subject of urban development, uh, under whom this the institutions were kind of under, uh, whose preview the whose preview these institutions, and also the secretary of the uh, ministry at that time, for the kind of freedom given to me to kind of apply and to test this knowledge in the work that I initiated in the National Physical Planning Department and the Urban Development Authority. I had a great freedom. I have been fortunate to learn lead the team that made the national physical planning policy and the plan in Sri Lanka, which is a complex, critical, and difficult task. Given the multivariate nature of the audience, both literally and compl the practically, complexity of the process and the procedures to be followed, difficulties in comprehensions, consensus, and compromises, which I suggest as the theme for today's lecture, the making and unmaking of the national physical plan. To me, it was a tremendous exposure to the real world, to a person like me who had no experience in this administration and the government procedures, and a lifetime experience and a rare opportunity for any learn, uh, to learn and gain endurance and wisdom. Having completed the three years, three and a half years of work in the National Physical Planning Department and three years in the Urban Development Authority, now I, were, now I was little, a little confident with the lessons learned through both successes and failures, associations and disassociations, praisings and criticisms, flowers and stones. I was certain that I could gain some level of wisdom and the maturity required in a professorship. When I was 
about to come back to the university, relinquishing my duties in both institutions, I was forced by the same set of colleagues in my department to launch my application for the professorship. That is how I became a professor today. And nevertheless, if I, now you can test me out of this presentation that I make today and also the, uh, with the work that I'm going to make in, do in future, whether I'm a real professor or not, it's maybe a testing ground for you, right? But whatever it is, I can sense that some of the qualities in professor is already being developing in me, to tell you very frankly. We know about these prof nutty professors and professor calculus. Some of the qualities like absent-mindedness and talking too much. So I, I feel like I'm getting that, right? So it means I'm a professor, right? Okay, fine, anyway, right, fine, anyway, let me, let me kind of uh, avoid that to the best level of my, my ability. And let's now get into the main focus of our, our, our uh, discussion today, presentation today, right? So uh, I believe all of you can see the slides. So as I said, so the experience that I got in the making and then making of the National Physical Plan 2050 so let me talk about the first part first, that is about this making of it, right? So it was a legitimate process. It involved the legality, and it was a political process as well. It involved a lot of facts and figures and assumptions and speculations as well. And it had a lot of scientific reasoning behind it. It was not just a document or arbitrary kind of uh, the uh, papers done by somebody. But it has some legendary inputs as well, where there is no science. It was a consultative effort. Large number of consultative sessions were carried out and also so many people involved in it. Nearly about 300 specialists, 300, uh, nearly uh, about 1,000 people who gave their kind of uh, ideas and suggestions. But it was a hegemonizing process as well because how much you do consultancy, all consultants are not going to give you the kind of result that you required. It's not going to take you anywhere building consensus among all these different ideas, but also contesting some ideologies as well. Right? But for me, at the end, it was a learning experience and also non unlearning event as well. Some of the things that I've learned throughout my research, throughout my uh, career in the university and also in the school and wherever I learned this from, of course, I have to give, it, give them a pause right? and get into some uh, critical path. Right? So let me uh, talk about it, about the legitimacy about it. So the National Physical Planning Policy prepared by the National Physical Planning Department, so this is a legitimate thing because it was done within a provision in a particular law. The Town and Country Planning Ordinance Number 13 of 1947, which was amended in uh, year 2000, Act Number 49, it provides in its Section 2 that there may be a National Physical Plan policy and a plan prepared accordingly with respect to land where there are no buildings, their own, and also on it goes on like that. So, so what I want to show here is this is a legitimate process. It's not an arbitrary decision of someone, right? But at the same time, it has a political component as well, because all these le legitimate processes are followed by geared by these political ideologies. Well, there are scientific, I, I mean, scientific reasoning, and also this uh, some factual and also some some uh, estimates as well. Now this 6% steady growth in the national economy, which is, was the target of the government of that time, and 1 million employment opportunities. But if you ask me where this magical number 1 million comes from, of course, I don't know. That's what I said. These things are assumptions, right? So and also 100 economic development zones. Why not it's 50? Why not it's 60? Don't ask me that question, because I don't know, right? So increased opportunities for genetic, uh, foreign direct investment, of course, we all agree. For some reason, we happen to depend on foreign direct investments. So the balance developed across the island, we all like, we all have like to have it. And sustainable use of land, water, and other resources, fine. So these are, these are things that we, we happen to kind of meet with in this national physical plan as short-term targets. And there are some medium-term targets as well. But for a long time, every successive government in Sri Lanka was talking about this transformation of the economy from conventional industries to high-tech to knowledge-based industries. Whether we should do or not, it's a different question, but this seems to be the trend in the world, right? So in order to go towards this required national level development, GDP, high GDP, and so on, this was, an op this was a requirement. So increased accessibility across the island, 
through road connections and rail connections and so on. This was a requirement that everybody agreed. And exploration of a lot of resources that's available for development which has been untapped for so, uh, so far. Right. Then there were long-term targets. I believe uh, whether they were not supported by facts and the scientific evidence, we all agree these things have to be there. Right? So water resources, which is a very, very critical one. So we all got to uh, maintain, we all got to uh, preserve it. And climate change is a topic that everyone is talking about and has become a research agenda, a big research agenda and investment as well. So there is evidence, there is non-evidence, there are assumptions with regard to that, but still, whatever it is, that has become a part of the government's the priorities. Right. So there are hazards, the, the disasters coming all over the island. Increasingly, they are happening and they're taking place and also reported as well. So there's no way that the government can look the other way. So it has to be addressed in the plan. Urbanization is something that I'm going to talk about today. So this is also something that has to be addressed in the plan. So increase international trade. So the debate that's going on today in the parliament even is about this, how to make our, our place international trade hub. Right. So this, is, this has been there in the agenda of the government for a long time. Right. So whatever it is, so we happen to follow this legitimate process. So for a period of about three years, nearly three years, it was going on with a lot of consultations, surveys, analysis, draft preparations, communication, and getting consult the consensus, and all that. And finally, in June 2019, we managed to make it a gazette notification, the enactment, so that it becomes a law. So to date, it remains intact. Therefore, it's supposed to be the law. It's supposed to be the National Physical Plan for Sri Lanka. Right. So the plan was prepared based on four policies, guiding policies, that we call it. We call it. The first one is the conservation of the critical and the unique resources of Sri Lanka. It can be sensitive settings, water resources, and natural ecosystems, which are uh, important for this, uh, the, uh, the economy and also for social, social cultural environment as well, sustainable development. This is something that, that is very, very important. Everybody highlighted that. Right? Even today, we, we value that, even though there are inconsistencies here and there. Then the second one is to direct all these future human settlements into areas which are livable for human beings, rather than going into a sprawl all over the island. So direct them into certain locations where you find the most livable environments in terms of uh, climate, in terms of disasters, in terms of land availability, in terms of infrastructure and everything. The fourth one is about the resources that was that are available even to date, which are, have not been explored so far, and also enhancement of the available ones, known ones, like human resources, they can be, or can be the natural resources, they can be land, they can be other type of uh, the scenic beauty and all that, which has not been tapped so far. Right? So these were the four guiding principles, guiding uh, the policies, I would say, that had uh, enabled us to uh, develop the National Physical Plan. So I will not go into details as of now, but whatever it is, this is, uh, all these details are available in the Gazette notification, how the, the w w what contains the plan. But the background information is available in the National Physical Plan Department's website. If anybody is interested in, of course, you can still go to the website and fi they find this information. But let me get into this more important part of it, the focus of today's thing. And what was our contribution from academia, the rare opportunity that I got to contribute for this plan? Right? Well, there are four areas I'm going to talk about today, four areas of research. First one, inductive inquiry. The main one is about this urbanization. Because the dominant understanding in Sri Lanka is that Sri Lanka is a country with majority rural population, predominantly based on agriculture. So the urbanization, this worldly kind of, uh, the commonly accepted uh, process of urbanization does not seem to be fit into the Sri Lankan situation for some reason because we know while the entire world is going ahead with this urbanization, this is a map that shows within uh, how, how these cities are become expanded and they, they, they explode with populations. 
So it is estimated in about 10 years' time, more than half of the population in the world. And by 2050, more than 75% of the population in the world will be living in cities, in urban areas. So this is the trend. But look at the situation in Sri Lanka. So it shows this is the, uh, the level of urbanization in different countries around the world. See where Sri Lanka is. We are one of the least urbanized countries according to these numbers that's given to us. So these are statistics. And according to the statistics, our level of population, the urbanization, the, the share of urban population is less than 20%. Okay, so we are one of the least urban countries in the world. So what kind of an image that people will have about Sri Lanka? Whether it's good or bad is a different one, different reason. But look at the official statistics. Right? Now, according to the Sri Lanka's official statistics, Department of Census and Statistics, it shows that we had an urban level of a share of urban population of 18% in 1971, which has gone down to 14% in 2001, and now gradually increasing up to 18.2 in 2012. Maybe in next census we may find it little more than 20%. Right? But is this true? This is something that we got to contest because we know. Even though this trend pattern shows this our population growth is declining, and we know in the ground we can experience that more and more people are living in urban areas with urban facilities, right? And also the world trend is more urbanization and less rural populations. Can Sri Lanka be an exception? This is something that we want to contest. So for that reason, we wanted to see what actually is happening. See, these are the urban areas according to the census figures, all urban and municipal council areas. Right? So what we did was, we want to see what is, what's wrong with these figures. How has these figures gone wrong and what does not, why, why these figures do not show the ground situation. Right? So this information are misleading. They give the misleading picture of the level of urbanization of the population in the society. And it shows that some of the politicians even very proudly say, we are a rural country, therefore let's invest on this urban infrastructure, rural infrastructure. Right? So let's, let's provide more for that. And therefore, misappropriation of investments and national and provincial institutions, budgetary allocations on the rural development. In the name of rural development, what are we doing? Right? So therefore, we happened to undertake a research when I was in the department. So this is what we did. We tried to see. What is the real, real uh, meaning of urban in Sri Lankan context? How it can be interpreted? What had went wrong, what had gone wrong with these definitions in Sri Lankan context? We could see there was a change from the early uh, eight, uh, 1800s, the 1900s. So we had these urban councils, municipal councils, and the town councils, which were regarded as urban areas until 1980s. To some extent, of course, this was fair enough because we had most of the people, those who are urban per se, urban qualities, urban facilities they enjoy, they were living in these urban uh, municipal councils and urban councils and village councils. But in 1984, government at that time merged this town council, the smallest unit of this urban, with village councils and declared them as Pradesh Sabhas. Now what happens, now the census department takes this Pradesh Sabha's entire things as rural areas. So it is shown as rural population. So that is how it had happened. So we're not happy with that. And we were seeing, okay, what are the different approaches that's available around the world in the national context? And we found there are demography-based demography approaches, density-based approaches, economy-based approaches, administrative approaches like in Sri Lanka. And there are morphological and functional approaches as well. So out of this, uh, countries that we have studied, we found out of 228 countries, a majority of the countries are taking multiple criteria rather than taking one administrative criteria. Right? So what are the ones that's available? Nevertheless, of course, we found there are a lot of critics about it. Already there are people criticizing about it. Right? Uh, okay. I would seem this oversimplification, the criticism was on that. 
So can we simply say this dichotomy of rivers? That means there, there are distinct urban areas and distinct rural areas. This is something that has to be questioned. And also there's urban rural areas. That means there are rural areas, just like what's happening in Sri Lanka. But they have urban facilities and urban characteristics. So can they be rural areas anymore? And more importantly, we got this definition, or we got this research by Louis Wirth. Urbanism as a way of life. <clears throat> so urban is not fully or accurately measured by the proportion of the population living in cities. And the influence which cities exert upon the social life of man are greater than the ratio of the urban population that would indicate. Right. So therefore, this was fascinating for us. Of course, we took it as the way to kind of find definition. So we based on this Maslow's hierarchy of needs because we know, as he said, so one level of needs are fulfilled, lead you to kind of get into another level of the needs. So that leads to urban, urban aspirations and urban needs in this manner. So this is how we wanted to kind of uh, identify what are the mandates of becoming urban and how they're expressed through different uh, qualities and what are the attributes that can be observed and what are the indicators with which they can be measured. Right? So the essential mandates that we got were the access to urban facilities, urban lifestyles, and urban aspirations. Right? So we had an analysis. Access to urban facilities could be expressed with different things and also attributes we got was the pipe borne water supply the main grid electricity from dom for domestic lighting and uh, the other uses, the gas or electricity for cooking, not the conventional uh, firewood, and paved local authority maintained access roads. And the local authority for solid waste collection and disposal, somebody else is taking your, the responsibility of disposal. Right? So these are urban facilities. And the urban aspirations as well, where the level of attainment of education for future not going into this agriculture-based industries, but to go into to the service sector, to the industrial sector, which are urban by definition. Therefore, the type of education and access to internet facilities and so on for that. Right? Then the urban lifestyles. The main source of household income is coming from non-rural sector, that is agriculture, plantation, or fisheries. So service sector or some other, other urban sector and the sector of employment of the majority of the people. The daily routine, whether they, they, they behave like the, uh, the, uh, the rural folks, or is it very urban type of life? For example, we, we, we wake up early in the morning and rush to these offices and do our work and office and come back home in the evening and no time to do kind of gardening or whatever. And even do we gardening, we do it as kind of part-time work, which is not the kind of rural way of life, right? So what type of routine is there? And the type of shelter which expresses your way of life, the bathing facility, toilet facilities, and the type of houses, and so on. And the means of communication, right? The devices that they use, and the language proficiency, all that shows the urban way of life, right? So with all that, we have got about 70 different indicators, right, to measure this. And what we have used was none other than this census and statistics department data that they have presented in their own reports. So it's the same thing that we have used. Right? And we got it on Gram Seven Udari division uh, wise. And the method used for analysis is a simple, simple analysis. Okay, the cumulative uh, figures and the average but, uh, by uh, cumulative values. Right? This is the picture that we got. The final result came something like this. Okay, in terms of these three, mandates, who is urban? Virtually everybody and virtually nobody. Right? It seems that everybody is urban to some level and everybody is not urban to that level. Right? So we had figures, now you can see this column at the center cumulative value and the level of urbanization or to what level they are urbanized is given in the first column. So less than 0.5 percent, okay, less than uh, the, about 4.5, less than 1 percent, is more than 90 percent urban, and about 2.2 percent is about more than 90, 80 percent urban, and about 8 percent, let's say 7.5 percent, was more than 
70% urban and about 15%, nearly 15% is about 60% urban and about one quarter, little more than one quarter, 26%, is about half urbanized. This is the picture that we got, right? But more important thing that we can see is in future, it's very likely these cohorts are going to change because increasingly urban facilities, urban aspirations, urban lifestyles are kind of embraced by the people. So there's going to be a drastic change here because there are bigger numbers here, right? So what we can experience is today, this is how the graph is. So we can see less people more urban and more people more rural in that manner. But in next 10 years' time, it's very likely this is going to move upwards. So we can expect by 2030, about 50% of the total population will be more than 50% urban. So that is the urban population that we will be talking about in real sense, right? So where do they live? So let's look at the spatial distribution. Now the diagram given to your, uh, I believe it's right hand, it's left hand side in your, in your screen, right? And uh, that shows according to the census department's definition where the urban populations are. The 80% people, more than 80% urban are given in the figure that's to your right hand side. Right. When it's to 60%, 70%, this is what the picture, it's expanded. And when it's 60%, this is how it is. Let's look at the critical critical cohort that is more than 40%. Right? In that situation, what would it be? They're everywhere. So this is a situation that we can understand. So rather than these people are migrating into the urban areas as it's popularly happening in many of the countries, but here what happens is rather than people coming into these urban areas, the urban facility seems to be going in search of people. So that is the type of development that's happening here. So it's very much in line with this famous Henry Leffber's urban revolution. The argument that he makes is people or every society from the zero, that means from the day that they started the civilizations, are in a process of going towards urbanizing. So everybody is becoming urban little by little throughout different processes, becoming the political city, mercantile city, and industrial city after the industrial revolution. And we are in a critical zone now it's an explosion. It's going to be a kind of a implosion, explosion situation where urbanization is happening at a very fast rate than it had happened in, 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 previous, uh, in the previous decades or the previous centuries, right? So we are going to become a complete urban. So do we have the right picture of urbanization in Sri Lanka? Because the society which is being resulted by complete urbanization process is an urban society. So we are going to be an urban society in that way. If we take these census figures, what will be the implication? So what is the policy implication in that, right? So we know our population is growing slow, even, uh, even though it was 1.2 at that time. It may be less than that in these years. I'm sure it's going to be less in the next census year. So we may end up with maybe about 25 million maximum in about 30 years' time, right? So our dense population density is about 18 persons per hectare. Some people say it's very high. I don't know, to me, it doesn't seem to be a high figure, right? It's not a density, actually. It's gradually urbanizing. This is the area. I mean, density is fine, but urbanization is the issue. Right? Why? Because urbanization means urban lifestyles. Urban li lifestyles change urban la the land uses. Land uses change the landscape. Landscape affect the environment. So how? So this is something that we got to think about. Right? How does it change? So most of the agricultural lands, marshes and wetlands, they will lead to reclamation. For the, because of the demand for the land. And they lead to the questions of environmental quality. And the built-up areas, increasingly building up because of these people's aspirations and needs to serve them. So the decreased ground assimilation, increased runoff and imbalance in the ground feeding, therefore questions of livability. And also increased discharge because of this consumption and dumping of waste, the land pollution, soil pollution, and question of sustainability and the land fragmentation as well. So all this lead to soil erosion, unproductive land, and the question of sustainability. And it, it, has, it leads to so many different issues. This is something that we got to address. And for that, of course, we had a lot of analysis, a lot of studies, and we know these agricultural users, they cannot be compromised for any reason because the food security is also something that we got to address. And so there are wildlife reserves, there are catchment of water resources, there are land subjects, and with all that, 
And also, there are things that we got to understand, the eco-sensitive areas, biodiversity, that is something that we got to think about. And also the water catchment areas, not the water bodies by themselves, but the catchments that matters, along with this elanga, that is the ca cascade systems. Right? And in addition to that, we have other so many things to be considered. For example, the areas prone to disasters, landslides, floods, cyclones, and so many other things. So with all that, we are left out with about 12% of the total land which is livable. Well, not an issue. Of course, we can manage it. But we have to have a strategy for that. So this urbanization, the transformation of the land uses have to be arrested into certain areas, certain locations. That is what is suggested in this National Physical Plan. I'm showing you this, the main strategy for this urbanization. The series of uh, the towns, the, uh, the urban areas, urban locations, which are proposed in the National Physical Plan. So as I said earlier, you can see the background study in this document that's available in the NPP web, web, in National Physical Plan Department, National Physical Planning Department's website. Right? So I'm showing you here the strategy. So that is what was attempted in that. Right? So second area of research. This is something a bit speculative, exploratory revisiting of this main argument because the population dynamics also shift the political power as well. Right? So we have the common understanding when you ask why these capital cities in Sri Lanka, the monarch or the king kingdoms have shifted from one location to another. Right? Okay, the common argument that is placed is non-livability due to epidemics. Some say the epidemic outbreaks, they, shift, they, uh, they, they compelled the kingdoms to be shifted. And also the depletion of resources and the climate change impacts. That is also said disasters and so on. And the threat of foreign invasions. Okay, all that is fine. These are common arguments. Can there be other dimensions as well? Okay, this is something that you want to see. If you look at the kind of de the development happened throughout the, his the history, from the fourth century BC, this Anuradhapura, as we know, is the first established monarch or the consolidated capital in for, for a long time, for more than 1,100 years. Then, at the same time, we know there was a shadow capital or the shadow monarch that was in Magam because at every instance where there was an invasion, they, 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 uh, they uh, set back to this uh, Magama and got organized in that place and fight back. That is how it had happened. So Magama had been there throughout as we know. Right? So the Polonnaruwa has become the kingdom or the monarch from the uh, 12th to 13th century after about 1,000 years. Right? Then it shifted to Kurunagala and then to uh, Dabadenia and then to Yapahua and then to Kana, the Gampalan then back, came back to Kandy in this 15th century. It has been there for some time, right? So what was the logic behind it? Are these the three reasons that was given or can there be other reasons as well? And we all know that court has become a kingdom in the 15th century. And parallel to that, there were other kingdoms like the Raigama, Jaffna, and Sitavaka, and all that emerged at the same time. And there are some one rulers as well. So how do you explain that? What is, how, how, do, how can we explain this in an alternative hypothesis? Right? So we want to look at this population dynamics. So in four census years, there is the population distribution pattern in Sri Lanka in different uh, DS divisions. And when we look at the differences between different census years, this is the picture that we got. Right? I'm approaching this argument. Right? The blue color one shows the where the populations have reduced, and the brown color one shows where the populations have increased between different census years. Right? Okay. Now this is a bit of a bit of a critical thing. We have we have we try to integrate some of these concepts coming from physics. All of you know about this center of gravity. So can we have some implications, some, some insights from that into this location of the power, location of the monarchy to that? We know, in, uh, as we have analyzed with the statistics that's available in 1881, the first census in Sri Lanka, the figures show if we put into this analysis taking population as the mass, if we take population as the mass, right, we can see the center of mass is in Kandy. We all know until such time, this candy was very powerful in terms of its politics. It was the center which could not be defeated for a long time by this, even the, the, the uh, foreigners. Right? So in 1971, after about 90 years, it was shifting towards Colombo and after 100 years, we can see it is settled in Colombo. 
in terms of population dynamics, right? So we know this for the last 100 years, Colombo has been the center of uh, the political power. Right? So what's happening after that? Right? In 1994, it was shifting gradually interior. And 2011 census figures, when you analyze, we got like that. Okay, little, this is a little bit of fiction, it may be, but but does that implicate anything about the 2021 when it's going to be? Maybe the next census here we can see where it's going to be. But more important that we can see is can we explain this with this population dynamics and the relationship it has with this location or the center of power? Right. So the Anuradhapura was the kingdom at that time. Maybe because it was the strategic location and put strategy the place to govern the country, as selected by King Panduka Abhi, he might have sensed, okay, maybe the other places are not strategic because he wanted to rule the entire country, entire island. So for him, Anuradha could have, could have been the kind of strategic location. And the Magama also had been, had a strategic location for that because the, the figures or the kind of mentions in the historic texts like Bahawans and the other texts indicate about certain places as numerous where the populations were gathered and Gamni and Gam and all that, right? So why had that shifted to this Polon Narva? We all know that this was shifted to Polon Narva first, not by the single king, it was this Kali Maga who shifted the monarch from Anuradhapura to Polon Narva in the name of Jananathapuram, which was defeated by this Vijayabahu the Great and he took it back to Anuradhapura. But after some time, he also felt this is not the location. This was not the location. So he came back to Polon Naru. Maybe the reason that it was the place, it was not the place to govern. The more important place to, or the more strategic location for governance could have been Polon Naru, because the populations have shifted to that area by that time, right? Then it goes on like that. And when the whole country was populated, we can imagine that that's why it was divided into three sects, three different areas called Ruhunu Piti Maya. Where there were provincial kingdoms with some domination by certain parties in certain areas, right? Some monarchs in certain areas. And by 15th century, we know this whole thing was merged into one, and Kandy became the historic, the kind of strategic place. So it could have been the reason why Kandy was selected for, uh, other than the reasons for defense and the uh, the other kind of resources availability. But this could have been another reason why it had been a kingdom of that time, right? So by about 15th century, 16th century, we know that it was scattered all over. So there were so many different kingdoms other than the Kandian kingdom, which was the most powerful, and the Kota kingdom was there, and there's Wani and Jaffna kingdom as well. So there could have been reasons why the population dynamics have enabled them to select the places for governance, right? And then somebody will ask this question about why not, then how come Colombo? What is its dynamic? Why these people have selected Colombo? There's a reason for that. We can argue, okay, this is a British empire. For British, interior politics does not matter. For them, it was a more strategic location for them to govern the entire this Indian uh, subcontinent, which was their which was their kingdom, which was their empire, right? So in that way, Calcutta would have been Calcutta, which was selected as the capital for this entire the the South Indian Empire, uh, the Indian Empire, South Asian Empire. So it was a more strategic location for them to connect all the other places. And also, we know Colombo had been the connecting point because it was the sea that was connecting them rather than the interior. So the interior was connected to the outside world with Colombo. That's how Colombo became the capital city. That's the main argument of that, right? So with that, okay, let's move into this, uh, these today's situations. So in 1994, it was like that. 2011, it was like that. But does, does it explain anything about this power politics in Sri Lanka, right? Does Colombo hold the center of power of politics anymore? What are the subtleties of regionalization of the politics? We all know that there are certain regions are emerging. There are some political parties emerging from certain areas. This is a bit critical. So although there are policy implications, right? So with the ongoing developments, what would like to, to happen? We will find this is going away from this Colombo some more, right? With this going on development activities at the expected populations in those areas, right? So we can think. The policy implications can be, of course, there can be natural trends for the desired directions. And which way do we want to kind of develop it? Right. And also, the power politics. Gradually shifting on the center of power. The, 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 who is going to kind of uh, the, uh, lose the grip? Okay, let's not talk any more about this one because it's very controversial and we have to do more research on this area. 
So let's anybody's let's do our research in in future about this one, right? And also, the desired location would be this, and this would be desired look the pattern of uh, distribution. So that's why I said it involves some level of political uh, in, uh, activities as a political envisagement as well, right? So so that's about it. So let's get into the third area of research, that is explanatory evaluation. So this population characteristics and the spatial order. So we all know we have a population that is increasing, uh, increasing a declining rate. And also literacy rate is more than 95%. And unemployment rate is 4 to 6%. But we have studied this primary, secondary, and tertiary education patterns in Sri Lanka. And we found the difference, and which shows there are certain areas where the primary and secondary education has changed. But tertiary education seems to be increasingly, increasingly increased. So there's a demand for that. And we compared this with this unemployment situation in Sri Lanka in two different years. And we find there are certain areas where the unemployment rate has gone down while there are areas the unemployment rate has gone up. Which are the areas where the unemployment rate has gone up? We compare that with this level of tertiary education. Right? So we can see in areas where there's tertiary education is high, there's unemployment. What does it mean? It means we have an unemployment not because of uneducation. It is the educated unemployment. We all know, even today's government's main challenge is to provide employment for the graduates and the educated people. So what should be the policy? Right? So this is something that we wanted to see. The projection situation is the same. It's not, not different to the year. So what are the, the implications of that finding? Okay, We are literate, so increasingly better educated. We can see from figures. Increasingly, we have about 30% of the people, those who have a tertiary education, it's very likely by 2030, we'll have half of the population will be going into tertiary education, not necessarily in the universities, but also for, from the technical colleges and so on, skilled people, right? So can we go ahead with this traditional way of providing employment? Higher attainment, higher expectations, and therefore new type of opportunities, especially these innovation-based industries and maybe kind of new opportunities, and also the government's policies of providing employment in this government organization, will that do? Right? This is something we have to see, think very seriously. Right? So for that, this is what this plan suggests. Having done so many uh, studies with the different agencies, consultations, and so on. Right? Okay. So let me uh, move into the fourth area, that is the experimental simulation. This is something a uh, bit of a, I would say it's kind of a hypothetical kind of a simulation part of it. So uh, as of now, Okay, so we have uh, the situation where this configuration of the infrastructure roads and so on lead to everything to Colombo. So we have the traditional uh, town centers are losing their importance, while new town centers are emerging and growing very fast as well. In everywhere in Sri Lanka, we find some of these traditional town centers like Kaduan, Nava, Matale, and those places are kind of declining. They, they are the same towns that we have seen 10 years back. But whereas the Pirimatalava and Ambalantota and all these places, they are growing very fast. How? What, what, how do we explain this? How can we explain this? This, experiment, this is a kind of exp the experimental simulation that we did for that. And for that, we took all infrastructure that has been developed and that, has be, that is being developed in the country uh, as at that time. And this is something we developed in the University of Morocco that is in our department itself. Uh, started as one of our young colleagues that is uh, the, today is a kind of a PhD guy. Uh, Dr. Amila, Amila Jaisinger's first research work on the connectivity analysis. We, we wanted to reduce all these motorable roads into these actu node actual diagrams. And with that, we did a simple analysis. Right? This is, we started it in Kegol district, because he was coming from that area, he was familiar with that area. And a simple analysis of this uh, the, uh, graph analysis. The, the connectivity, relative connectivity of uh, from one location to another, how connected each place to the other places. And the result was this, the very first research we did. <coughs> it shows there's a connection between, there's a relationship between the level of urban, that means the potential level of urbanization and the connectivity. The mo in other words, the most connected places are most developed. Most, they have the most number of urban activities, most uh, number of populations, most number of traffic congestions and everything. So everything is related to each other, right? So the connectivity seems to be the tool. It seems to be the kind of logic behind it, right? So then we did it to the whole of Sri Lanka. This is how it was in 2010 with the available road network. It's A, B, and C class roads, right? 
but with the ongoing developments it's going to be like this in 2030 well we can be happy about it more places are becoming urban most places are having potential they gain potentials and they will be developed but can we be happy about it with everything what will be the implications right so we have to be careful because if we let it go like this there's a natural trend and also there's a desired pattern as well because not that every place can be urban every place can attract population because there are sensitive areas like for example hill country the water catchment areas the environment degradation is happening very fast even now and they have a current capacity so if they exceed the current capacity what will be next and also certain areas which doesn't have infrastructure so there will be a need for an excessive investment on the infrastructure in those areas and also some of the infrastructure that has already been developed will not be utilized to the optimum level if we neglect them right so these are the issues with that so with that okay the areas that cannot be developed and that can be developed the red ones are the critical ones and the gray ones are the most possible ones and also the areas more, which are more livable which i explained earlier uh, the higher the dark blue colors shows the most livable areas and the light blue ones show the non livable areas in terms of disasters supply of the, uh, the uh, infrastructure and the temperature and rainfall and everything and the availability of land when we give lands for agriculture reserves and biodiversity and everything and the proximity to roads and all that right and also different potential available we try to map it in different ways but uh, it was not captured to the best but however the accessibility to this resource avail avail places where the resources are available for tourism for nature for industries and everything right and this is what is envisaged by the plan as the infrastructure network mainly the roads and expressways and the railways so you may find not that every expressway that is being developed today is included into this one there are certain one that can be considered after 2030 for example candy and this anuradhapura one right and instead the potential for a road a rail network because it's more important for us to have the connectivity than the kind of uh, the ribbon developments right so that is what is expected here right. and with that this is a special structure that is finally proposed in the plan right so the main highlights is the conserved natural resources forest areas sensitive areas and the ecosystems and there are four urban conurbations i would not use the word corridor because it has lead to so many repercussions at a later stage so the conurbations right so which uh, main one is from kalambu to trincomalee not the entire thing is a conurbation but there are some gaps in between but as a concept we can understand it works as a corridor right but in addition to that there are three other corridors one from jaffna to kilinochi the other one is from chenkaladi that is in uh, batiklo to ampare and from Gold to Tissamaharam areas. In addition to that, there are two metropolitan areas which ha we, we cannot give up, that is with the available facilities and available development, that's in Kandy and Anuradhapura. In addition to that, there are nine locations which have been identified to be developed as main service centers. Mena, Mulatiu, Vaunia, Putlam, Polonnaruva, Mayangana, Vallavaya, Nuvareli and Ratnapura, which are the most connected and serving for the bigger catchments not big cities but main urban centers but in addition to that there can be small centers everywhere so our, our, our intention was to get this population concentrated into these parts in the near future in about 20 to 30 years time and that will optimize the road infrastructure and the land land and other resources as well right so it doesn't mean that we are going to shift all this population take them and resettle in these places in, in, in overnight but it's a kind of gradual attraction by providing employment, by providing housing, by providing facilities and attraction of the next, next generation of, of the population into these areas. So that was the strategy that was suggested here because it's a long term plan, right? So that is about the national physical plan, how it has been made and I have, I have highlighted the important area that we could integrate into this, uh, into the, 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 some of the research that we did in the university into this national physical plan. So let me talk about the other side of the story as well, that is about the second part of it, unmaking of it. Right? Well, interestingly, that also was a political process and also the legitimate process as well. It has some legitimacy in that. And it also had facts and figures, and also assumptions and speculations as well. And some scientific reasoning and some legends as well, a lot of stories behind it. And consultative efforts and some hegemonies as well. Right? And it there was consensus that, that means there were committees uh, pointed to investigate and then some contesting ideologies as well some uh, 
But for me, again, it was a learning experience and unlearning event as well. Right? So let's see. The first one, this is the first, first challenge that came in, the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Okay, so we had no whatsoever kind of uh, relationship with the MCC. National Physical Plan Department had no discussion, had no meeting, had no consultation with the MCC. So the MCC seems to have, the, uh, according to the, the kind of information that we got, they, proposed, they, they, they agreed to fund three projects proposed by the Sri Lankan government. First one is road traffic signal improvement system proposed by the RDA. Second one is the, high cooler, uh, sir, the circular highway construction and improvements proposed by, again, the RDA and the formation of land information base proposed by the survey department and the Ministry of Lands. And the National Physical Plan Department has no relationship what, what, whatsoever with these things, right? So, but whatever it is, this is how it had came and we can see the impact. They got this National Physical Plan as a tool and it has been shown as the Millennium Challenge Corporation is going to kind of take the entire corridor and the focus was this Trincom the, the Colombo Trincomoli Corridor, right? So there were a lot of protests going on, there were a lot of discussions and the kind of uh, the, uh, the stories behind it. And, it, and I, I, I was proudly saying my little department, National Physical Plan Department, it's a small department, which was not known by many. I was saying these people in the department, be happy, because your, your department had been so powerful to even topple the government, right, with this, right. So at the end, we had the president appointed a committee to kind of uh, investigate the truths and facts about it. Okay, they have handed over the report and we got some extract out of it, now that everything has come out, right? And there was a second situation where this parallel project was going on, that the ADB has funded this Colombo uh, Trincomal Economic Corridor Development, because this corridor idea was not, uh, it, it was not the National Physical Plan first proposed this idea. It was first proposed by one of our professors in the university, that's a Professor William Mendes in 1970s, 80s at that time, right? So maybe based on the nuances of that, of course, maybe this ADB also supported this project. So the idea was to develop this, uh, the corridor, but the corridor suggested here seems to be much bigger than what was suggested by the National Physical Plan, right? But anyway, this was coincided with that and for, the, for good or bad, of course, they, they got kind of merged into this one. This is not a corridor as such, but this is a kind of a big region, right? So whatever it is, this also came at the same time. So there are a lot of misconceptions, speculation. This is how it was reduced by the people, of course. Many people interpreted this. Even in the internet and the YouTube, you can see interesting kind of discussion, in, in, uh, the kind of preaching was going on. They got this picture and they, they, they understood this yellow line that was conceptually indicating the possible corridor as a fence that divides Sri Lanka into two. And it was saying that it is an American corridor mingled with this MCC compact. And it was said, the whole thing is going to be owned by America and the Sri Lanka will be divided in two. And it was also said this corridor is a continuous built up area. That means the buildings are located next to each other from Colombo to Trincomalee about 200 kilometers. This was a picture that is given to the people, right? So it's much of a speculation. And interestingly, they were said, all these American troops will be freely marching across this corridor, right? I don't know how, where, where this idea has come from. Whether it is true or not, of course, that also I don't know. But this was what was told at that time. So these are speculations, these are stories, these are kind of uh, the, maybe sometimes, of course, fix the, the, the facts and figures, I don't know, right? Somebody has to investigate. And the fourth one is the most vicious one. I would say among these professionals, which I have, which really disparated me, of course, this kind of uh, disgusting, because some people said, this is, oh, this is somebody's idea. He was the one who proposed it. We don't like him. He's not in our clan. He's not in our club. Therefore, it's, the corridor ideas are not good. And what got victimized at the end is the national physical plan because of this somebody something and people's disliking of some people. And therefore, you got to throw not only the basin and the water, but also the baby as well. So to throw the whole thing, shell the plan. That was this most critical and I would say it's the kind of most uh, the kind of a bad experience that I have got, I have, I have, come, I have come to learn about the professionals, the so-called professionals, right? But this one has a legitimate process. Of course, this, the government, uh, the kind of candidate who was contesting for this presidentship at that time, they had a plan of their own. So they proposed it. Instead of this national physical plan, of course, they proposed a C-shaped economic corridor, which I have not seen yet with four multi-dimensional commercial areas in the policy manifesto, it was very clearly mentioned. 
So it was it was time that if it was the uh, plan, of course, the national physical properties proposed plan has to be kind of replaced with that, which has not been done yet. But right. So these were the reasons how it has got uh, shelved and not no not kind of implemented so far. Whether implemented or not, still I don't know. So with all that, so all development that had happened happened in the past can be history, and so has the national physical plan. Whether it is part of the history or not, I don't know because still the cassette notification is valid. Still, that is the plan until such time that uh, that new plan will be uh, uh, kind of uh, the prepared and implemented, which I don't see is happening now, right? And uh, whatever it is, if we go ahead with this type of development, the future of development in Sri Lanka will be a mystery. We all know that. But all this provides us a new area of research, new ground for research. That's what I got to say. And let me uh, talk to you a little bit about the things that I have learned out of it. Right. So, three. Uh, the, 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 it, it resonates with certain things to me from cinema, which is a kind of pet. The, I, I take it as a pet subject of mine, other than the planning and architecture. Right. So this David Gordon Green's 2015 famous movie that is Crisis. Our brand is Crisis. It shows how you can make devils out of paper. As long as the darkness remains, people are ignorant, and even the kind of people, knowledgeable people, also remain silent. The facts are silent in the darkness of fears. This is something that I, I have learned out of this whole making and unmaking process. The second one is the Babel. This is Gonzalez movie in 2006, international movie, which shows how a tool can be a gifted to a person as a gift. And it can be a toy that can be tested by children. And it can be a weapon to kill someone right, with vicious intentions. Because it's the intention that makes the meaning to the tool, the purpose that gives meaning to the tool. So as that at what happened to the National Physical Plan, it was used as a tool by many for different purposes. Right? Finally, the famous Akira Kurosawa Japanese movie, Rashomon, which shows multiple narrations of things that had happened of a certain event, same event, same event is interpreted by different people. So if we take this whole making and unmaking of the National Physical Plan as part of the history, well, it's an episode that is narrated by different parties in different ways. So the conclusions are relative to the intentions. It all depends on how you interpret it, right? So this is what I have learned out of this parallel to this cinematic kind of experience that I had. So it gives me a lot of lessons out of it. So what I, have, uh, what I got to say at the end is, from the uh, preachings of the Lord Buddha, the success provides you satisfaction. When something, said, when something is successful, we all are happy with it. The failures provide you with wisdom, which I have gained. And it is the courage to continue that counts. It is the hope that drives the world. Right? So this is the lesson that I have got, and that enabled me to apply for this professorship at the end. That's why I thought of apply uh, the kind of making this presentation in this inaugural lecture today, right? And thank you very much for your patience for the last one hour, 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, Professor Singha. I think, uh, yes, and the audience stayed with us for the time. And just to conclude, uh, may I invite uh, our Vice Chancellor, Professor Niranjan Gunawardhana to give the uh, to the token of appreciation to the So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, now we have a task at FGS. This is a monthly event. So, every month on a third week, Thursday, or the fourth week, we will have this evening session, one hour, on this sharing of or introducing our professors to the public and looking at what we are doing and what we are capable of doing from University of Moratua. Thank you very much and have a good day.